Hello, everyone. Welcome to ACP's live remote non-CE offering. I'm Lynn Forney, and I'll be the moderator for today. The non-CE topic today is part of our Tips Tuesday series and covers information on advanced technology and electrotherapy for patients with severe deconditioning. It will last approximately 30 minutes. It is now my pleasure to introduce Andre Axt, who will be our presenter today. Andre is a physical therapist and serves as a clinical content specialist for ACP. So I will turn it over to Andre. Take it away. Hello, everyone, and thank you again for joining us. My name, again, is Andre Axt, and I'm a clinical content specialist with Accelerated Care Plus. I'm responsible for the development of ACP burst content such as the tip of the month and identification and summation of the research article of the month. The focus of this webinar is to review a recent tip of the month and research article of the month on severe deconditioning. We will discuss what a tip of the month is, what a research article of the month is, and then we will look in detail at both the April tip of the month rehabilitation for severe deconditioning using advanced technology and electrical stimulation and the April Research Article of the Month, Reduced Physical Activity in Young and Older Adults, Metabolic and Musculoskeletal Implications. The image to the left is the April Tip of the Month. The Tip of the Month is a one-page document which is sent to ACP partners and posted on social media monthly. You likely receive this from your ACP Clinical Program Consultant. The tip focuses on a current topic of interest or a treatment approach that may, be need, uh, may need to be highlighted or further explained. The image on the right is the April Research Article of the Month. The Research Article of the Month is a recent article within the last two years and typically on a topic related to therapy, geriatrics, and interdisciplinary patient care. The article is an open access article, allowing it to be shared with ACP partners. These two documents will be the handouts for this webinar, and I will email them to you later today. The April 2020 tip of the month is titled Rehabilitation for Severe Deconditioning Using Advanced Technology and Electrical Stimulation. This is an image of the tip which again is one of the handouts. The tip of the month has a standardized format. It is a one page document meant to provide information in an easy to read and understand layout that the therapist can then apply into their practice. At the top, you will see the title of the tip <clears throat> with the main program icon related position to the right. You can see here the tip is related to the cardiopulmonary program. The tip starts with some background information or statistics, provides supporting research, and offers advanced technology and biophysical agent treatment approaches. References are provided at the bottom of the page. Unlike the research article of the month, which is an open access article, the references in the tip of the month are a mixture of open access and articles which require special access. The next se several slides will actually break down this April tip of the month. First, we look at deconditioning and who is deconditioned. Deconditioning is a process of physiological changes after a period of time in which an individual is typically less active than they were previously. Individuals who present with a compromised pulmonary system are acutely ill or hospitalized for extended periods may become deconditioned or develop hospital-acquired muscle weakness, among other deleterious effects. Even healthy individuals may become deconditioned and frail if they decrease their activity level due to social distancing and limiting time outside their room or home. You may have experienced the effects of deconditioning recently during the current COVID-19 pandemic with your patients, family members, or yourself. With increased age, these effects may not be easily reversed. This was highlighted in an article by Bowden Davies and colleagues in which they found effects of short-term physical inactivity with step reduction were reversible on resumption of habitual 
<clears throat> physical activity in younger people, but less so in older adults. This study is the research article of the month for this webinar and will be discussed in depth shortly. Deconditioning may lead to frailty. A meta-analysis and systematic review by <clears throat> Kojima included five studies with 3,528 community-dwelling older adults and found that frailty and pre-frailty are significant predictors of nursing home placement among community-dwelling older adults. They stated that frailty generally progresses but can be potentially modified by interventions of physical exercise, including aerobic exercise and resistance exercise. Rehab professionals should continue to emphasize activity and participation in therapy and use all tools available, including electrical stimulation, cycle ergometry, virtual reality, and balance trainers to assist in this goal. It is very important with severely deconditioned people to monitor their vital signs before, during, and after exercise interventions. This will assist the therapist in determining the appropriate exercise dose and need for rest. Vital signs may include heart rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, respiratory rate, and rate of perceived exertion. Standardized outcome measures should be used at baseline and throughout treatment to demonstrate progress. These may include the timed up and go, two or six minute walk test, gait speed, modified clinical test for sensory interaction of balance, dynamic gait index, 30 second sit to stand, five times sit to stand, short physical performance battery, Berg, functional reach, the Barthel index, and St. Louis University mental status examination. There are many others, as you all know. To access these and other outcome measures, you can simply do an internet search or go to the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab at rehabmeasures.org. Research supports the use of advanced technologies in the treatment of individuals with severe deconditioning. There are numerous articles that support the use of technology. These are just a few. In the article, Effects of High-Intensity Interval Training on Exercise Capacity in People with Chronic Pulmonary Conditions, a narrative review, Sawyer and colleagues found that high-intensity interval training increases cardiorespiratory fitness and exercise capacity and provides similar effects to continuous training for individuals with COPD. In Rokowski and colleagues' research, virtual reality rehabilitation in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a randomized controlled trial, they investigated the effects of inpatient-based rehabilitation of 106 patients with COPD using non-immersive virtual reality with a traditional pulmonary rehab program. They compared virtual reality plus endurance training to virtual reality alone and virtual reality alone to endurance training alone. They concluded that pulmonary rehab program supplemented with virtual reality training is a beneficial intervention to improve physical fitness in patients with COPD. <clears throat> Bojoli and colleagues research randomized control trials of transcutaneous electrical muscle stimulation of the lower extremities in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease investigated whether transcutaneous electrical muscle stimulation of the lower extremities can improve muscle strength and exercise tolerance in patients with moderate to severe COPD. In this study, patterned electrical neuromuscular stimulation, PENS, was applied to the quadriceps and hamstring muscles of patients with COPD three times a week for six weeks. This resulted in a 30% increase in strength and a 34% increase in the distance walked on a shuttle walk test compared to patients treated with sham e -STEM. Advanced technology can play a vital role in helping the severely deconditioned individual participate and progress in therapy. Cycle ergometry, the omnicycle with smart assist technology can be used <clears throat> with varied levels of resistance and patient participation, allowing individuals to participate even when they are unable independently. 
interval training may be used to increase the overall time and intensity of training. Again, in the Sawyer article, high intensity interval training increased cardiorespiratory fitness and exercise capacity and provided similar effects to continuous training for those individuals with COPD. Virtual reality, the Omni VR, can be performed with patients in a seated or standing position, depending on their ability and the focus desired for that activity. Individuals who perform exercise using the VR typically <clears throat> work harder and longer and often find the activities and games to be fun. Balance trainers, the OmniStand, can be used with patients who are unable to stand independently, providing varied support and assistance. This allows the therapist to safely and easily work with these patients to provide effective and progressive balance and gait training. The use of PENS protocols to the muscle groups most affecting functional performance prior to or during exercise may improve muscle recruitment, <clears throat> strength, participation, and function. The protocols pictured here are ones that are commonly used in the deconditioned population. The first is the quad hamstring protocol, followed by the lower extremity and upper extremity cycling protocols, and the walking protocol. There are numerous others that would be appropriate for this population, and um, you can access those through uh, your CPC or through Penn's Labs. Now we're gonna talk about the research article of the month. The research article of the month for April 2020 was reduced physical activity in young and older adults metabolic and musculoskeletal implications. This is an open access article, and again, it will be one of the handouts that you receive after this course. First, we're gonna go over a little bit of um, physical activity guidelines for Americans. Um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans, second edition, which came out in November of 2018, stated that strong evidence was reported for regular physical activity, <clears throat> having health benefits for everyone and being safe and ben with benefits outweighing the risk for most people. Key guidelines included adults should move more and sit less. That makes sense. Um, and this really does make sense, um, but having it in writing with these guidelines really um, gives people information to follow. For substantial benefits, adults should do at least 150 to 300 minutes per week spread out throughout the week of moderate intensity aerobic activity. For older adults, physical activity should include multi-component physical activity. This may include balance training and aerobic muscle training. When older adults cannot do 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity per week due to chronic conditions. They should be as physically active as their abilities and conditions allow. It is estimated that 90% of American population does not achieve physical activity guidelines. The health benefits of physical activity and exercise are well established and are the reason for physical activity guidelines for adults, as just discussed. There is less understanding regarding the detrimental effects of inactivity. This research study uses short-term daily step reduction to investigate these effects. In a 2019 review article, Reduced Physical Activity in Young and Older Adults, Metabolic and Musculoskeletal Implications, the authors focus their research on the harmful effects of physical inactivity. They evaluated studies that included reduced physical activity and increasing sedentary behavior due to step reduction, as this seemed to represent what happens with acute illness, hospitalization, and societal changes related to technology and work patterns. In one study, participants started with approximately 10,000 steps per day and were reduced to 1,500 steps per day for two weeks. 
Overall, studies showed effects of inactivity due to step reduction in untrained individuals, even short-term reduction in physical activity, has a significant impact on skeletal muscle protein and carbohydrate metabolism, causing anabolic and peripheral resistance. Short-term inactivity induced peripheral insulin resistance in skeletal muscle and adipose tissue with consequent liver triglyceride accumulation leading to hepatic insulin resistance and characteristic dyslipidemia, abnormal amount of lipids in the blood. Inactivity factors contribute to decline in cardiorespiratory fitness, muscle mass, and muscle strength. Increased sedentary time is associated with increased risk of all-cause cardiovascular mortality. Individuals with 14 days of reduced ambulatory activity showed increased adipose tissue and ectopic fat. This occurs in tissue that normally has very little fat, such as the liver, skeletal muscle, heart, and pancreas. For return to prior step levels, Resumption of normal physical activity after a period of reduced activity may not restore normal glucose metabolism rates and muscle protein synthesis for older adults. Possible countermeasures to prevent the deleterious effects are the addition of daily aerobic exercise to those undergoing step reduction. Um, this prevented changes in insulin sensitivity and low load resistance exercise of lower extremity performed three times a week for two weeks during step reduction attenuated uh, the effects of step reduction in some individuals. The authors concluded physical inactivity may be especially harmful to certain populations, those at high risk of type 2 diabetes and the elderly. They went on to say the effects of short term physical activity step reduction are reversible on resumption of regular physical activity in younger populations, but less so in older adults. Nutritional supplementation and exercise offers potential treatment to stop negative metabolic musculoskeletal effects. Regular physical activity is essential to good health and should be continued during times of social distancing. Older deconditioned adults may have more difficulty attaining or maintaining recommended levels of physical activity due to illness, injury, impairment, neurologic involvement, and pulmonary compromise. As a result, therapists will see and treat patients who are more frail, ACP's biological agents, <clears throat> excuse me, biophysical agents, OmniCycle, OmniVR, and OmniStand are tools that may assist individuals to perform exercise longer with higher intensities, allowing them to progress towards activity recommendations. A review of contraindications, warnings, and precautions should be conducted prior to the use of biophysical agents and advanced technologies in the treatment of your patients. This concludes the presentation of the tip of the month and the research article of the month. I do wanna thank you for breaking down the information in the tip of the month and the research article of the month. Um, it was excellent and informative to presentation on a really important topic. So I wanna thank you for that.